mean, you have a tremendous amount of stuff that happens that ferment in the brain, kind of weird stuff that happens while you're practicing. It's like a side effect. And then you, you know, it's, it makes me happy to just write it, write it down. And, I, and you know, it's whatever I'm working on or, uh, you know, things and reading notes, reminding myself to do my taxes. It's a little bit all over the place, you know. <laughs> Here it says, why do singers have to be singers? <laughs> Whoops. Try to do another minor one. Hmm. What the hell? Yeah, we'll just do it. So I just play and talk about two sort of diametrically opposed <laughs> variations. Um, for some reason, my sentimental favorite is this variation 18. And I've heard from other people that it's their favorite too. And, um, and I, it's hard to say why, because as complicated and interesting as the canon was of the minor one, uh, this one, this canon is almost like a children's counterpoint exercise. And it's a canon at the sixth. So the second voice is a, the interval of a sixth, six keys above the first note. Bach writes a wonderful bass line to make all that sound wonderful. And you could play that probably more poetically if you It's amazing how he finds this kind of profundity in something that is so basic, so childlike, so in effect very exercise-like. On the other end of the spectrum, um, a variation which, in which the bass and the theme and everything loses its innocence completely is the last minor key variation. Um, one of the few variations that's actually marked with a tempo, adagio, to tell you don't, don't play it too fast, you jerk. Um, in this case, um, in, instead of the four bass notes that you began with, which are very simple, in which you just have the four notes of the G major scale, instead of those, Bach um, begins filling in what you might call the chromatic cracks, the cracks in between those notes. So instead of just... And the way he does this is amazing because the, the sort of most transgressive note is probably the F. The E flat is also pretty shocking. And he kind of makes a way of dwelling or allowing those notes to come out in a way that maximizes the shock value and the sense of being lost. That in those cracks that, the, that we've become kind of dropped into some weird abyss in those cracks of the bass. So it's like this very normal beginning. I think it's very important how Bach doesn't have any bass under that top melody note for a moment. And now the bass goes from G to F sharp. So far, so good. The bass that we just heard was F sharp and this F flat is not playing nice with that F sharp. Ah, there's the crack of the F natural. A 
again. Those two notes are as ugly as possibly can be imagined in that style, but the, the, e, the e natural of that note is just a memory. And Bach keeps doing just this kind of thing. He takes these, he finds every crack in the, in the bass and exploits it. The next thing that is important to notice is that the right hand doesn't seem to want to play with the left hand either. Um, it's constantly in a rhythmic battle. Like, as I said, not with the left hand, the main note of the melody, and then always syncopated against, almost always anyway. So there's this great sense that the that everything is being torn uh, into bits and apart. And there's this terrible sense of, of uh, sort of a nihilistic, <laughs> sudden, sudden nihilism creeping onto the stage of this piece. A great despair and kind of weird emptiness.